dielectric breakdown weathering effects on the comminution of lunar regolith. Thanks. I don't envy you having to read that, so I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> I apologize if I start coughing. I'm still getting over a cold. So this is a collaboration between uh, the LRO Crater Instrument, it's a cosmic ray telescope, and the uh, Servi Dream 2 team. Um, and we've been looking at, for the past couple years, deep dielectric charging, particularly in permanently shadowed regions. I've shown this slide a few times, so my apologies if you've seen it before, but it helps me get going, and for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a great introduction. Um, so in permanently shadowed regions, actually anywhere on the moon, uh, SCPs will penetrate down to about one millimeter or so into the subsurface. And we showed back in uh, 2014 that electrons tend to penetrate just a little deeper than the protons do. So that gives you some charge separation. Um, and in this cartoony um, picture with just three protons and three electrons, you get a bit of an electric field right in the middle there and then no electric field above or below. And you can have any um, variation here, any kind of um, fluence of particles. And then over time, the charging dissipates, just like in a leaky capacitor, um, where the regolith is both the capacitor, it's with whole, uh, keeping the charges separate, but it's also a resistor, too, so the charges are flowing through. And then eventually you get no electric field at all. <coughs> Excuse me. But in a really large solar energetic particle event, um, some of the really big ones can charge the regolith much faster then the regolith can discharge it. So that electric field there in that gap can actually get um, very strong. And if you get a fluence of about 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11 particles per centimeter squared within the discharging time scale, the electric field becomes so great that you actually get sparking. So the dielectric medium, which was really um, insulating, electrically insulating, actually becomes conductive. So you get all these plasma channels in there that work to short out the circuit. Um, some of you might be wondering how SCPs, or solar energy particles, can get into um, permanently shadowed regions. And they tend to be fairly isotropic. We actually have crater data, and LRO is orbiting the moon, and during an SCP event, you actually see that there's hardly any change no matter which side of the moon you're on. There's a little bit of a change, a few percent, but it's not all that significant. So SCPs are very capable of getting into PSRs. This is actually an image from an uh, old review paper on dielectric breakdown. The neat thing is that the colder the regolith, the lower the electrical conductivity of the regolith, the more charging you can get, the greater those electric fields can become, so the more likely you are to get breakdown. That's why we've been focusing on PSRs. And this is a, it's a well-known phenomenon in um, spacecraft engineering. It's actually the leading cause of spacecraft failure. Um, but it hasn't really been looked at as a possible source of weathering. Uh, there have been a few papers in the past. Um, so. We've been really trying to push this and see um, what might be going on. So how much energy has breakdown deposited in permanently shadowed regions? And then we'll compare this to what meteorites do, just to give a sense for how effective this might be in comminution. So what we do is we put together um, the energy density of um, a given event. That's a function of SCP fluence. So fluence is just time integrated flux. Combine that with the event rate, which is also a function of SCP fluence. Small SCP events tend to happen a lot more often than the really, really big ones that we're interested in, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, it's better for astronauts and spacecraft. Um, combine those, that gives the rate at which energy is deposited into the regolith. And then there's an exposure time. That's limited by meteoritic gardening, which tends to bury material, mix it together. And that means that the regolith is exposed no more than about a million years to the, these SCPs. They're getting down about a millimeter into the soil. Put it all together, and you get total breakdown energy. So um, just to give you a feel for what the energy density might look like here, these are kind of funky um, labels on the axes, so I apologize for that. The bottom is um, the log base 10 of the fluence, and on the y-axis is the electric field energy density. This is in the subsurface again. So right about here is a um, SCP event that can just barely produce breakdown. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fluence of about 2 times 10 to the 10 particles per centimeter squared, and this is actually based on a, um, a, a 
believe it was the uh, SCATHA satellite which looked at um, charging and breakdown of components. And they figured out that fluence. Um, and you can see that the joules per meter cube there is about 10. Crater has seen a few decent sized um, SCP events. These are the two biggest in January and March, and they were fairly similar. Um, not much more fluence than a threshold breakdown causing event. Um, but because the electric field energy density depends on the strength of the electric field squared, it's about an order of magnitude um, greater energy density. Now that we're on the declining phase of the solar cycle, especially a really weak solar cycle, like Nathan pointed out this morning, um, we're hoping that we might get a really, really big SCP event. They often happen like that. Carrington event would be really nice. I can't order it, unfortunately. So the event rate is shown sort of in this figure. It's not exactly the event rate. It's a combination of event rate plus exposure time. So this is how many events, the number of breakdown um, inducing SCP events that have occurred um, in both the North and South Polar regions. And you can see it's mostly focused on um, PSR regions where they've experienced about a million breakdown events. So about one event per year. And again, this does depend on event fluence. Um, this is summing up all the ones. Oops. Which way? That way. Um, this is summing up all the events that could possibly cause breakdown. So we put it all together, and what do we have? And I want to say bibbidi bobbidi boo, but I should. Um, the energy deposited over that one million years of exposure is about 10 to the 9 joules per meter cubed. If you compare that to how much energy you need in order to vaporize all the regolith, you need about 10 to the 10 joules per meter cubed. So we're looking at about a tenth that. So enough energy to vaporize 10% of the regolith thereabouts. Um, let's see. So if we combine that with meteorites, um, the energy flux of meteorites into the regolith is actually about an order of magnitude greater than the energy flux of breakdown into the regolith. But breakdown is a lot more efficient at heating regolith because almost all the electric field energy is converted into joule heating. There's just a very little bit on the order of 1% that goes into emission and moving stuff around. So you can see then the vapor and melt production rates are actually comparable. Um, and so you're looking at on the order of 10% of the regolith being vaporized and or melted. So it seems like it could be comparable to meteoritic weathering in PSRs. Now we don't have any observations of this. All we know are what happens in spacecraft, what happens in the lab, and then we also can measure SCP events. Um, but we haven't observed this yet. So there's also a little bit of a plea for help. Um, so what, what effects might this have on comminution? Now, the rest of this talk is also kind of hand-wavy, just um, trying to get a handle on this. This is about the best model that I've seen um, of comminution by McKay et al. back in 74. And there's replenishment of coarse particles. Coarse particles are on the order of 100 microns across. The replenishment comes from impacts that dig all the way down to bedrock and bring up more coarse material. Um, impacts will pulverize the coarse particles, create fine particles. These can be agglutinated. The agglutinates can be pulverized, so then you get a little bit um, of feedback there. And so this just keeps going on. The breakdown model of soil evolution uh, is kind of loosey-goosey at this point. There's fine particles um, that can probably include some coarse particles, some fine particles. Um, some of those are going to be fragmented because it's, it's an explosive process. You get a spark going through, it can actually split material up. This is actually being looked at um, uh, by some folks as a means of actually separating out ore. Um, they're just shocking rocks with big, um, uh, big batteries, basically. So it feeds into finer particles. But during breakdown, you're also getting vapor and melt creation. So maybe some of those particles are sticking together. The vapor is getting deposited in other, other grains. So who knows what's going on there? And how does that interact with that? We have no idea. But we'll take a little bit of a stab at this. So this is probably what happens. That's the cartoon from earlier on. You get breakdown sparking going across many grains. That's one millimeter. So there's at least 10 or so grains on the vertical axis there, maybe more. <coughs> And in the model, we assume this, a bunch of ugly cubes, and they experience breakdown. And the breakdown channel goes, has a constant width, um, and it goes through different sections of different cubes. So it's kind of stochastic there. Vaporizing the channel. 
and then that channel explodes, and so some of the grains fragment, others just get little donut holes, those fragment. And then we recube the grains. Now we have more grains. Some of them are they're all a little bit smaller. We also um, deposit the vapor on the other grains, and we can control that. That's a little knob that we can control. Um, and then we just keep running it until we've dumped all the energy into the system um, that we need. So these are just real preliminary results, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, starting particle size, all of them were 100 microns on a side. The input breakdown energy was 10 to the 9 joules per meter cubed. Um, and this is what we have. So let's see, on the x-axis, you've got from 0 to 100 microns on a side, and then the fraction of particles. And we started this run with 10,000 particles. And so you can see right here, about 10% of the particles are still around 100 microns. And then all the rest are distributed out all the way down to about 5 microns. This little drop off here, down below 20 microns, is just um, due to the fact that the breakdown channel is now on the order of the particle size. So if breakdown happens to zap one of those tiny particles, it's gone. It's just completely vaporized. So they don't last too long out here. So most of the particles are bigger than that. So this is just really pre preliminary, just to kind of get the creative juices flowing. Um, and what we'd like to do is explore some parameter space just to get an idea of what might be going on, especially in PSRs. I know there's um, resource prospector. They need to know what the geotechnical properties of the soil are, and this might give them some idea of what could happen there. Also, optical properties. And then this thing, um, I'd definitely be interested in getting some feedback on. Is it in Apollo samples? Because we've got a lot of that sitting around. Um, and here's just two different ways that this material could be in Apollo samples. Um, if breakdown only occurs in PSRs, there are impacts that could maybe transport or eject some material down to lower latitudes. Given that if um, breakdown is only happening in PSRs, we're only having a fraction of a percent of all the garden regolith all over the moon being broken down, and then you mix just a little bit of that fraction down it to lower latitudes, there's not going to be much down there. But, and this is something that we've just started looking at, breakdown could occur on the night side of the moon. The temperatures do get down just below about 100 Kelvin. And that is just cool enough for some of the really big SCP events um, to be able to cre create, break, uh, create breakdown. If so, it could be that a few percent of all garden regolith, no matter where you are on the moon, has experienced breakdown. If that's the case, then yeah, we probably do have sparked material sitting in a vault somewhere. Fingers crossed. I'm not... I don't think I would bet on it, but you never know. So in conclusion, breakdown weathering does seem have the potential to be comparable to meteoritic weathering, um, and it may help drive comminution. And we really do need ex um, experiments to test some of these ideas. Um, we're starting some collaborations, and we're going to hopefully get the ball rolling on that. And if you've got some ideas for that, please talk to me. And then there's a lot of open questions. If breakdown is going on, how does that mix in with meteoritic comminution? Um, is it possible for LRO or maybe even a ground-based instrument to detect breakdown as it happens, so sparking in those PSRs in particular? Um, so far, the answer is negatory, but we've only had a couple really tiny events, um, so maybe there's a big one in the future. Could the material be in some of the samples that we have? And does it affect other airless bodies like Mercury here? Um, that's experiencing many more SCP events, much larger ones, it's also experiencing a heavier rate of gardening as well. So that's something that we're going to be looking into in the future. That's it. Any questions for Andrew? Doug Curry, University of Maryland. Uh, two questions on detection. Is there mm -hmm. light that would be emitted through the surface? Yes. So, so in principle, you could see a flash. Yes. And the other would be, uh, would there be radio emission? Uh, the answer to that would also be yes. I've tried to figure out what kind of emission we might be able to expect from it, but it's been kind of hard because most of what I found is based on lightning research, and I'm not sure that how much of an, al an analogy I can draw from lightning, but yeah. You keep talking about vaporization and melting, but... Fundamentally, what you're doing is you're putting energy into the system, mm -hmm. and you could be activating disequilibrium chemistry um, since, since the surface is highly saturated with, with protons. 
Mm -hmm. And so you can get a lot of things like nanophase iron production without melting and without vaporization. And we've oh, done that cool. plenty of times in the lab. Uh -huh. So think about other ways of finding it rather than looking for melting. Okay. Because you don't need that much energy to get to get significant weathering. Okay. And what was your name, by the way? Oh, Dan. These guys know me. <laughs> uh, Dan Britt, University of Central Florida. Okay. Great. I can't even see you with the light here. Uh, Paul Hain, JPL, have you tried plugging in your your size distribution of the particles that you get from your simulation into a a me code or something to look at what the albedo and, and like in the I'm thinking about the lamp data and the mm -hmm. VSRs are dark at Lyman alpha wavelengths and so what you could do is take the the output from your simulation and then calculate um, using a ready to transfer model the the albedo you'd expect at those wavelengths um, and see if that matches the data. Oh, we haven't done that, and that's a great idea. I'll have to talk to you about that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.